Hi to everybody, I'm Vittoria Vecchiotti, a PhD student from uh, Gran Sasso Science Institute uh, in L'Aquila, Italy. And today I will talk about constraining variegate energy diffuse gamma and neutrino emission with the Tibet data. But let me start. This is the outline of my talk. So first I will describe uh, briefly the galactic gamma ray neutrino signal. Then I will introduce our model for describing the galactic gamma ray and neutrino diffuse emission. Then I will tell you how we perform an estimate of the unresolved sources that are sources that are uh, too faint for being detected. And I will explain you why these things are connected, so don't worry. And then I will uh, tell you my results. So let's start. This you already have seen today in the lecture, in the other talks. So as you know, uh, IceCube is detecting a very high energy neutrino signal around 100 TV. And this, this signal, uh, the majority of this signal is expected to be of extragalactic origin. Although high energy neutrino are also produced inside our galaxy. So therefore a galactic component cannot be excluded. And uh, now the interesting things of neutrinos is that they are produced in the same uh, mechanism, hadronic mechanism, in which also gamma ray are produced. So you have already seen this, an accelerated hadrons can interact, then produce uh, charge and neutral pions, that then they decay and produce gamma rays and neutrinos. And this is very interesting because then you can think that you can use gamma ray observation to constrain the neutrino signal. Now, but where this process uh, can happen in our galaxy, uh, actually this process can happen inside sources, this star is a source, and uh, so you have uh, that uh, accelerated hadrons interact with the ambient medium and produce gamma neutrinos that you can detect at uh, here. Or, and what can also happen is that uh, these hadrons can, uh, one, for example, can escape the source and propagate in the galactic magnetic field and then interact uh, uh, in some points in the galaxy. And this uh, will create, let's say, a diffuse uh, uh, component. And this is actually the component that we want to constrain uh, with gamma ray observation. Uh, now, recently, the Tibet detector has provided the first measurement of the galactic gamma ray diffuse emission in the super-UV energy range. And how do they do this? They take their signal and they mask the contribution from known TV sources listed in the TV source catalog in the TAPCAT. And this uh, could be a problem because uh, the Tibet measurements are uh, contaminated by the presence of unresolved sources. Uh, because of course the, the, the detectors that provide this list of sources here present in the catalog, they of course have a limited sensitivity threshold. So there are uh, some of the sources that are not bright enough and therefore you, you can confuse uh, their signal with a diffuse uh, signal. So what we did, we brought the con so this Tibet uh, data as the sum of a contribution from our resolved sources and a contribution from the diffuse emission. Uh, so, but let me go and explain uh, our model for the galactic gamma ray diffuse, uh, diffuse emission. So here you just need to perform uh, this integral where here you have the differential in elastic cross section of the PP process. And we take it from uh, the, the CBIS code. Here you have the interstellar gas distribution that is, uh, in our galaxy that is taken for Galprop. This is instead is the most challenging term because it's quite uncertain because it's the cosmic ray energy and spatial distribution in our galaxy. And let me go more in detail uh, regarding this term. So here we parameterize it as the product of these three uh, functions, where the first one is uh, simply the um, uh, cosmic ray spectrum measured at the sun position, so the local spectrum. This G of R is the cosmic ray distribution, uh, spatial distribution in our galaxy. So you can look at here, G of R in function of the galactocentric radius. The, our model is these black lines here. Uh, and is obtained that so this function is determined by taking consideration the distribution of cosmic ray sources that we consider um, that they are distributed as uh, proportional to the supernova remnant of number density, as in this paper, and also by taking in consideration the propagation of cosmic ray in uh, the galactic magnetic field. And then 
we have this last function that uh, take in consideration the possibility of a spatially dependent cosmic ray spectral index. What is this? Uh, these features emerged recently uh, by uh, analysis of the Fermilab data, okay, at 20 GV. So what they uh, infer is that the cosmic ray spectral index is becoming, uh, we say, harder in the direction of the galactic, uh, in the direction of the galactic center. And so uh, we consider two cases, one with and one without the specially dependent cosmic ray spectral index that from now on we will call hardening hypothesis. Then what we did, we calculate then the diffuse emission uh, in the two uh, different galactic region proved by Tibet. These red points are the Tibet points from the, for the diffuse emission. And here you have that the gray dashed line is our case with the hardening hypothesis, while the gray solid line is the, is the case without hardening. Now, what you can see from this plot that it seems that the case without hardening is a bit below the Tibet data. Instead, here the, the case with hardening, it kind of passed through the data. But still, then what happens if you look at this other region that is a bit farther away from the galactic center? So here you don't have uh, the hardening effect, and the two cases are almost the same. Sorry. Uh, here uh, you are not able to explain the deep data with neither of the two models. And here is because uh, we are forgetting that there are also a result source contribution. Okay, here I will go fast uh, just because, okay, we performed a population study of the galactic plane uh, survey of the S detector. And um, the assumption that all the sources are pulsar powered. And we were able to calculate the total flux produced by all the sources in our galaxy in the energy range 1, 100 TV. And uh, here, actually, you can see the uh, cumulative distribution of sources where the gray line is the experimental line that comes from the S detector. Uh, the blue and the red lines are our theoretical prediction. If you look at the dashed line, that's the S threshold, so the sensitivity threshold of the detector. And so uh, what you see that uh, above this, um, on this side of this dashed line, you expect that the detector is able to resolve all the sky, so it's able to see all the sources that are in its observational window. And therefore, of course, our theoretical model is fitted on this part of the data and it reproduces perfectly the, the experimental data. But below this threshold, you are, I mean, the detector is losing sources. Okay, this thing is not working anymore. Ah. One second. I don't know why this doesn't work anymore. Uh, maybe you can. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bo? Sorry. Ah, okay. It's such a beautiful slide that doesn't yeah, really look. <laughs> Did you have how many slides that you have left? One slide? Uh, a few more, but I mean, yeah. you can also go and if I, I don't know if you manage to. I can also go. Yeah, you can Okay. Sorry about that. No, don't worry. We also connect the Let's give it up. Too much Yeah, don't stop sharing whatever was going on there.
Okay, I hope they read the slide. So we calculate their result source contribution. And then what we did, we added up to the... Uh, <laughs> Okay, to the contribution of, uh, so we added up the contribution of our result sources to our uh, truly diffuse emission, let's say the diffuse emission with, without the hardening hypothesis. And let's see what we see. So this is the plot that I showed before. This is actually this green band is are the unresolved sources plus the diffuse emission without the hardening hypothesis. And as you can see that they kind of well explain the Tibet data and but it's actually kind it seems kind of impossible to disentangle bit among the uh, the two hypotheses i mean if it's this uh, bomb let's say is due to uh, spectral hardening or if it's due to the presence of unresolved sources so still but that's the reason why it's more interesting to look at this other region because in this case the unresolved sources seems to give a better explanation of the tibet data uh, and also, this is important because if you actually want to see if there is this hardening hypothesis, the key point is also to look at different regions in the sky. So now, once that after this, we are uh, convinced that in this energy range, it seems that the most probable case uh, diffuse emission uh, model is the one without hardening. So we did a rough estimate of uh, the, which one should be the contribution of from this uh, um, from the diffuse emission uh, to the I mean, to the galactic neutrino, the galactic neutrino diffuse emission to the ice cube signal. Uh, here is just the ice cube signal is taken from the 7.5 years of analysis and is the best fit for the high energy starting events that are the one that they, we think they could be contaminated by galactic uh, events. And then we just calculated the expected galactic uh, the neutrino diffuse emission at 100 TV integrated over this uh, galactic window. And we compared it with the above flux calculated at the same energy and integrated over the same window. And we found that the contribution is quite small. The galactic neutrino diffuse emission can contribute at most up to 1% of the total neutrino flux observed by ice cube. And uh, so this brings me to my summary that is just uh, summarize what I said till now that we model the gamma neutrino diffuse emission. We calculate the unresolved component from the S observation. We notice that in the PV energy range, the unresolved source uh, hypothesis seems to better explain the Tibet data respect to the hardening one. And we also give this estimate of the neutrino, the galactic neutrino diffuse emission that can contribute at most to up to percent of the total neutrino flux observed by us. And this is the conclusion. If you have questions, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? And, and sorry, by the way. Uh, so don't I worry. No we have to suffer the most here. <laughs> um, I have one question. Uh, so for your galactic diffuse uh, prediction, I also take into account a galactic arm structure that can also lead to some variation in uh, the right? You mean galactic structure in the sense in the gas? No. Yeah, the gas and also the distribution of sources. Uh, Wait, so in the sense that we may eventually calculating also the diffusion contribution from this kind of sources, so which one could be the neutrino contribution that comes from resolved sources? Uh, no, I should, I can do it. The point is that, um, okay, in this assumption, the, the, sources, the sources are pulsar wind nebula that in principle they are considered leptonic, but still it's interesting to see they could in principle accelerate also protons. There's, and uh, therefore they can could also be source uh, of neutrinos. And uh, yeah, I mean, actually I can do an estimate. I didn't do it, but I could do an estimate of, of the neutrino. I mean, if it uh, transform all the gamma rays coming from our result sources in uh, neutrinos, I could actually see which one should be the contribution that I expect. It's straightforward, but I didn't uh, do it. Uh, yes. If okay. that was the question. Yes. Uh, was, also, you said also the gas. Yeah, fine. The, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other uh, questions? Okay, everyone is uh, eager to get some coffee, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much. So, thanks to all the. To the